involved with this project. We have Tracy Hall, who runs Root Work here. We have Eric May, who runs Roots and Culture. We have Alma Weiser, who runs Heaven Gallery. And we have John, who runs uh, Chukamarka Space as well. And then lastly, we have Eric uh, from the Compound Yellow Space up in Oak Park. So we should have a really wide conversation about a number of different practices that happen in these different spaces here. The exhibition is curated by Allison Peters Quinn from the Hyde Park Art Center along with Noah Hanna. And my name is Sierra McKissick. I am the Public Programs Coordinator at the Hyde Park Art Center. And I'm really glad and grateful to be joining you all here today. So I'm gonna read a short bio for each of the different spaces. Um, so that you can learn a little bit more about what they do and then we'll dive into some questions and conversation. So pull this up here now. First up we have Chukamarca. It is a library project space focused on the native Mexican, Caribbean, and Central and South American contemporary art and cultural discourse. John did you want to say something about your space or a little introduction about yourself? Yeah, yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you, High Park Art Center, for inviting me for uh, to be part of the discussion. Uh, one, for part of the exhibition, then two, right now during the pandemic, I think it's uh, just very appreciative of that. Um, but also, before we start, I did want to acknowledge, uh, make a land acknowledgement real quick um, to uh, Chicago. Uh, for those of you, if we're all in Chicago, assuming uh, maybe we have some out of the city, but uh, Chicago is part of the traditional homelands of the councils of the three fires the Ottawa, Ojibwe, and Potawatomi nations. Uh, many other tribes such as the Miami, Hutchuk, Suck, and Fox also call this area home. Um, and I'm citing that from the 2019 Chicago Architecture Biennial uh, that was also made with the American Indian Center of Chicago. Awesome, thank you so much, John. And then we also have Root Work. Root Work Gallery showcases artistic expression that has healing, reconciliation, or the investigation of folk, street, and indigenous cultures at its core. Everyone, welcome Tracy D. Hall. Would you like to say something? Hi, everyone. Um, I also wanna extend that I'm very grateful to uh, be a steward of this place. Um, where I'm a visitor, and um, I want to also just, um, you know, extend a welcome to my grandmother, who is a co-curator, um, Bessie Marie uh, Guillard Sanders Scott. She's a co-creator of Root Work, and she, um, through a, a several a series of several dreams in New Orleans, uh, gave me the idea um, of Root Work Gallery. Um, you know, when I was 23, that manifested many years later. And I also want to shout out um, my uh, gallery assistant, uh, Kayla Johnson, who is in here. Um, I'm really excited to be here and just humbled really to be here with people that I respect and admire. And so thank you, Sierra. Thank you for the curation of the event. And I see so many people here that I want to shout out. Um, we're just among some amazing cultural workers. This is our time. And so I am looking forward to a robust conversation. Thank you, Tracy. We also have Alma from Heaven Gallery. Heaven Gallery is a nonprofit gallery and multidisciplinary art space in Chicago's Wicker Park neighborhood that encourages, mentors, and presents new and emerging artists, musicians, and filmmakers to audiences throughout Chicagoland and beyond. Everyone, welcome Alma. Would you like to say something? I'm happy to be here. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Alma. We also have Eric May from Roots and Culture. The mission of Roots and Culture Contemporary Art Center is to provide exhibition opportunities for leading edge emerging artists and to develop the city of Chicago's cultural community as a center for art production and a destination for artistic discourse. Hi, Eric, would you like to say something? Sure. Uh, hello, everyone. I miss seeing faces and hugs and being out and about and seeing art and sharing art. Um, I'd like to thank Sierra for putting this together and the Hyde Park Art Center. Uh, not to, not to uh, puff my chest, but Roots and Culture is one of five organizations that was in the first uh, Artists Run Chicago in 2009. Um, and I noticed that both of the curators are with us today. So I wanted to say hi to Britt and Bertrand and Allison Peters Quinn. Um, 
and yeah, it's great to be back. And uh, it seems like a really interesting time to pay attention to this activity and forge a future and have a conversation about it. So welcome everyone. And uh, I'm looking forward to this. Thank you, Eric. And last but certainly not least, we have Eric Peterson from Compound Yellow. And Compound Yellow is a nonprofit experimental art space with a curatorial focus in cultural production, sharing economies, participatory art, and interdisciplinary expo explorations, comprised of a group of artists, curators, educators, parents, and engaged citizens. Compound Yellow hosts exhibitions, interventions, performances, workshops, lectures, gatherings, and collective imagining. Everyone welcome Eric. Would you like to say something as well? I think you're on mute, Eric. You can, let me see if I can. Um, let me see. All right, Eric, are you there? Yes. All right. Hey everybody. Great. It's great to see you all. Um, totally missing seeing everybody. I'm here um, really uh, on behalf of Laura Schaefer, who's the heart and soul of Compound Yellow, which before was uh, the Southside Hub of Production in Hyde Park. Um, before that was Home Gallery. Before that was Op Shop. Um, and many of you have come out to one or all of those spaces. Um, and it's really the community and the sort of Chicagoland area that makes them possible. Um, but thank you so much for um, having us. And um, Laura says hi. She's had to um, go to another meeting um, regarding school and her sons, I believe. So hello, everybody. Thank you so much for stepping in for her, Eric. Really great to jump into the conversation with you all. And I'm really excited to have the exhibition whenever we're able to get back into the Hyde Park Art Center. There was a lot of really great buzz around the exhibition, a lot of hard work put into it. So we can't wait to share all of that with you all. And this is just uh, a bit of a teaser before we have that large production um, in our future. So I'm going to start off with some general questions for all of our panelists here. And if you do, feel free to jump in and answer. Um, we can wave if you'd like to have some sort of uh, way to see who's talking. Um, so we all don't jump all over each other, but I'm fairly certain that we will be fine and uh, able to jump into that. First, I want to know what the impetus uh, for all of your spaces were behind wanting to open your artist-run space. How did they start and what was the initial thought process behind that? And anyone can start with that. Um, well, don't all jump at once. <laughs> <laughs> I'll start with you, Alma, since you're on the screen here. How about you? Sure. How did happen start? Um, so, my husband actually started having gallery um, in the Flatiron in the late 90s. Um, and then he moved across the street to the current space in 2000. So I actually wasn't a part of its beginning, um, but I came later, uh, so about maybe 2009. Um, and it was around the same time that my husband was kind of like wanting to stop running a gallery because <laughs> it was just a lot of work. Um, and so I came and I said, no, let's just keep going until we possibly can't go any further. Um, and so here we are uh, 20 years in this same space. Um, and it's, um, I mean, artists are, I mean, Chicago is so great because of all of its artists. And, you know, we really forge these great relationships with these artists and it was, like seeing that kind of community that we have here that made me feel um, maybe inspired to make this much bigger and to keep going. Um, so that's kind of how we got started. Thank you so much for sharing. Tracy, did you want to share how RootWorks started? Sure. Um, I shared a little bit in the introduction and I always um, shout out my grandmother, um, because she was so influential in my life. And, you know, also I always joke with people that I was born into a family that was kind of like the Black Adams family. 
um, in that our family came from Louisiana in um, the late 40s, early 50s, and they brought with them a lot of folk uh, tradition around like you know, around spiritual practice and, you know, around things like hoodoo and things like that. And just the notion of healing that has gained a lot of popularity and traction today. I'm excited about that. But my grandmother was um, an artist um, in every sense of the word and that she was really happy creating. And she was a worker. My whole family is like really, um, you know, they were laborers and they really saw um, art practices as a part of that. It was sort of like a a repository for you know a lot of um, different ways of knowing and so I was always I've always been engaged in art in fact my um, my aunt told me just before her death she died um, in um, in January of this year she told me when I got a promotion um, in a job she said you know I'm really happy you know with what you're doing in your career but I'm not going to be truly happy until you go back to being an artist because I was an artist a maker a painter poet um, playwright, you know, pretty much all of my life. And then um, I stopped really creating when I became like more engaged in management. And I know that a few of us have talked about that, um, you know, in Chicago, what is it like to merge practices, um, you know, between being an artist and being an administrator of any kind. But as my administration um, roles got bigger, I stopped really doing my own um, art making and I became more interested in organizing around art. So um, what ended up ha happening for me in terms of root work is that I had the idea of having a gallery ever since I was about 23 and I was a student um, curator at the University of California, Santa Barbara while I was an art, uh, undergraduate, did a lot of art shows there. When I was a librarian, which I've returned to the field, I organized lots of art shows um, in, and participated in, in libraries. But my grandmother, when I came to Chicago, my grandmother came to me in a series of dreams and she, um, she took me through some things that she was doing around initiation when I was younger, which was just showing me how to use certain herbs. It's very interesting because that kind of stuff was, is what we're doing now in this moment, we've kind of returned to that. But for a while, talking about spirituality was almost akin to talking about the occult. People weren't talking about it in the same way. Not, you know, 20, the 20, where we are right now is interesting, but um, I felt the need to go back to my family's homeland, which is Louisiana. And when I was, um, as soon as I got in Louisiana, New Orleans, I um, literally um, fell into a long sleep and my grandmother just came back and when I, and, and told me a lot of things. And when I awakened, I um, wrote everything down. I saw my meditation teacher shortly thereafter back here in Chicago. And uh, he said, you know, your grandmother really wants you to bring those teachings and to integrate that with your art and um, in, in Chicago. And she really sees a place for that. In the dream, my, um, my grandmother had um, stood at the door of a house that would be at the crossroads and it would have a big tree emblazoned on it. On it and that tree had deep roots because my grandmother was a root worker like probably many of your grandmothers and grandfathers where, you know, it's not esoteric. I mean, it's how you stayed alive, you know, like today, right? Um, and so, um, I, I saw that that would be the place where I would have um, this space and I called it root work because that is the kind of healing that I grew up with. So it, it, root work came to me through a dream and the way that I always organized um, the work in root work, uh, which is on hiatus now, um, is um, by really listening deeply to conversations that I had uh, with my grandmother, you know, back when she, she was alive. My grandmother died when I was just about to turn 25. So I've been holding on to a lot when it comes to root work, but my grandmother has been right as rain and bringing back to the fore um, the ways in which we really know ourselves really deeply when we're surrendering. Wow, that's a beautiful story. I love how your your space is really rooted in spirituality and that mysticism and the fact that it came to you in that way and is rooted in so much ancestral history. Uh, that's really beautiful beginnings as well. I'm going to turn it over to Eric May. You're also one of the veterans for Artist Run Spaces in Chicago. Do you want to talk about roots and culture and how you all began? Sure. I mean, um, it was kind of a serendipity of finding the space, really. Um, there was kind of a confluence of influences and things that I was ambitious about. Um, I, I'd been working for another nonprofit, a 25, 30 year old nonprofit called Beacon Street Gallery, 
and I was sort of, uh, you know, learning the ropes there, uh, getting a feel for uh, community-based programming. I was also uh, super influenced by the um, earlier artist-run spaces. It was a very fertile time in 2006. Like, there was amazing spaces all over the neighborhood, like 40,000, Green Lantern, um, Heaven. Uh, I was hanging out at Heaven at, when I was fresh out of undergrad in the beginning. Great parties. Uh, <laughs> and also, uh, what else? Like, uh, Art Ledge, I wanna name check everybody I can. But anyway, so um, I was very, very, very profoundly uh, influenced by this idea of um, sort of dissolving the, the boundaries of where art could be exhibited. And I, I was really, really inspired by the domesticity, the hospitality, the slowing down of uh, experiencing artwork in someone's home. Um, so that kind of energy was part of what I brought to Roots and Culture. I, I always kind of describe it as a mullet situation. I, I wanted to have like professional in the front and party in the back, right? So like uh, a more, more of a, I wanted to have a polished exhibition space that would be uh, a desirable place for for young artists and emerging artists of all stripes to to hang their work and have an opportunity uh, and so that was really also a driving impetus was that i i kind of you know it, it's kind of long sort of uh talked about and lamented that chicago is really this city where there's these world-class art degree programs but artists kind of reach a ceiling at a certain point and there's a brain drain and folks flee to the coasts where there's more robust art markets. And I, I, I've never exactly aspired to be, a, a, you know, the cure for that. That's a bigger structural issue, but um, I just wanted to create an opportunity that might slow folks down. Like, uh, so sort of more recent graduates would have an opportunity to have a, you know, a pretty substantial opportunity in Chicago and uh, put down roots. Um, so yeah, it, it really though, I, none of it would have happened if I hadn't found the storefront at 1034 Milwaukee. Um, that was a very fortunate uh, moment. Um, that's, that's the story. Uh, thank you so much for sharing. And that's kind of serendipitous and great that you were able to build upon that just by finding this space first. I do have a question later that's specifically about physical space and what that means for an artist-run space, obviously. Um, but really great story. I biked past there the other day on one of my afternoon bike rides. So it's still intact and right there waiting for everybody to come back. I'm going to turn it over to Eric Peterson speaking on behalf of Laura. Um, can you tell us a little bit about Compound Yellow and its early beginnings? Hi. Um, yeah, I, I think I would like to tell a story that Laura told me, and I'm not sure how true it is, but I kind of love the story. I think it's mostly true, um, is that she was um, studying or, or just out of college and spent time in Berlin in the early 90s or mid 90s um, when Berlin, sort of before Berlin became um, blue chip artists and more when it was just like artists that were just scrapping by um, just post the uh, Berlin Wall coming down. Um, and so Berlin had this sort of like two-headed, was sort of a two-headed city where um, everything was old and everything was new, if that makes sense. Um, and I think that really made a huge um, impact on, on how Laura thought this, the life sh could be and should be. Um, and so, um, you know, I really, I think that a lot of the projects that she's done since uh, that time have been a way to sort of merge everyday life and and art life in a way that's um, 
not like putting oil and water together, but more like putting two different kinds of oil together that sort of mix and merge and, and mingle um, or, or like making a curry or something like that, um, where all those different spices come together and there's not sort of like high art, low art, comic book art, no people who live a non-art life. Um, you know, I really think she's a very generous um, and, you know, you know it, in many ways, like a polymath, like she, she will let anything be art, but she also makes sure that it's going to be, um, that it's dressed up in its best possible form, that it's made, you know, and she helps very young artists come in and, and, f and find their vision. Um, and then also lets artists who may have galleries and may have um, sort of traditional art market sales, um, do something that wouldn't sell or do something that's not art market at all. Um, so, so I, you know, I, I always think of that, the idea of this sort of like, you know, bombed out buildings in Berlin being used for art spaces um, that, or, or East German factories being used as art spaces or raves or um, things like that. Cause I really do think she brings that, ethos into her spaces. And I think it's also an ethos that's wonderful in Chicago, which is that, and I think Eric, um, it's in some ways because the art market where p rich people buy art is not as robust as other spaces. People who stay in Chicago don't care about that stuff as much. Um, and they're really building their own reason to make art. Um, and that's personally why I love the city as well. Um, and so that's that's sort of like, um, as far as I know, that's the origin story for for Laura's work. Um, but I think you can kind of see that um, in that uh, the all the projects have a sort of like, you know, let's just rock this out. Let's try it. Let's see how it goes. Let's bring in young artists. Let's bring in old artists. She's really also very very interested in intergenerational spaces. Um, I know with when I first met her with uh, the Southside Hub of Production in an old mansion, sort of ramshackle mansion that was connected to, I think it's the Hyde Park Unity Church, Unitarian Church. Um, she was on their uh, cho chorus. She was like a sing singing in the church choir and was like, hey, what's going on with this building? They're like, well, I don't know. And she was able to bring in 30, 40, 50 people to, you know, not all at the same time, but at different times to be able to create that space. And she's, um, uh, you know, sometimes I think about her as a, like a benevolent cult leader. Like she's good at, you know, she's good at bringing people in and getting the best out of them, but then she doesn't like ruin it with sort of like having, like she doesn't have multiple wives as far as I know or things like that. So, um, yeah, so um, I think that's all for me now. <laughs> Thank you, Eric. I love the metaphors that you chose, this idea of oil and curry and things simmering together, especially giving artists the opportunity, um, not only for growth, but experimentation. I think that that's really important for people to be able to do things that they are not necessarily able to do in um, high art spaces, or even the fact that you don't distinguish between those different kinds of types of art. So um, kudos to you all for that as well. I'm gonna hand it over to John from Chukamarka now. I know this is a newer space, um, one of our youngest ones. So do you wanna talk a bit about what your early beginnings are looking like? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm in my early beginnings, right? I don't even, well, I have a year old now uh, exhibiting and programming and trying to figure the what this uh, project is um, but basically as right now as a library project space um, it started off with a lot of questions um, trying to figure out uh, a specific question uh, here because so I'm from from Chicago and when I was uh, going to here at Washington College uh, when I first started getting into the arts um, I, all I really wanted to know or try to figure out is like what specific question was what Ecuadorian artists were doing in the 1970s. Um, and so I started going to the museum, started going to spaces, started like to read books and like look for any sources here in Chicago, started doing the email. We're talking about 2012, 2013. So uh, this was more than five years ago where we don't have so much 
uh, data on uh, a specific discourse. Um, and I couldn't find it here in Chicago. I couldn't find just the pace that just answered me like these were the four or five artists working in 1960 Ecuador. And um, it took a lot of research on my own to figure that out. Um, the steps that, that I took to get to that point were one, to go to Columbia College to figure out what is the art world, right? Um, I didn't know what it was, uh, specific contemporary. Um, and I'm like, I'm gonna figure it out and see if I could help in any which way uh, the discourse or discussion or try to answer this question that I have. Um, and in doing so, uh, in Colombia, I didn't find the answer, but when I did a residency in Ecuador, in Quito, Ecuador, uh, in this uh, residency called No Lugar, um, they're celebrating 10 years uh, uh, as, a, as a residency program, as an exhibition space. Um, they're really, really good. I always recommend everyone to go to that residency if they want to uh, experience another art world. Um, so basically when I went there off the bat, they showed me, well, like, these are the books that were made in 1960 by Ecuadorian artists, right? So I'm like, wow, I had to like go through a whole BA program, had to go through all these museums. And I just like, you know, uh, come first day in this residency and they're like, my answer has been, my question has been answered, right? Um, and when I came back to Chicago, I'm like, well, if I have these questions, I'm pretty sure other other people um, have specific questions as well within either their own background or just, uh, or just you know, questions of other art histories. Um, so I'm like, okay, well, what would a space that says this, uh, that tries to address this, or tries to answer or help answer this question, um, what would that look like? Um, and I'm like, I was just, and at that point, I'm still like, I don't know if I want to do a space. I don't know if I'm going to be the one directing it or what would that be? Like, what do I have to do? Do I have to like do, um, um, I don't know, sort of residencies just over and over again, or like, well, what does that look like? Um, so I asked a, a lot of people. Um, some of them are actually in the in the in the chat here, so that that's great to see them here. Um, I asked a lot of people, hey, like, if there's a space that says we want to talk about a specific discourse, um, what would that look like, right? Um, and I got different opinions, different uh, feedback, a lot of good feedback from. A, a variety of people, uh, which I'm super grateful for, for their time for giving me. Um, but then now I have all this feedback and all this information and I'm here trying to pass the baton to like someone that doesn't exist that wants to, um, you know, take on like a space to do it. And I'm like, okay, well, I guess I have to be the one to do it, right? So I'm like, let me just throw myself out there and like just say, let's just make a space and see what happens. Um, so that's how, the library project space came up, having the books as resources and also having an exhibition space for artists who want to talk about the social and cultural uh, aspects of their work. Um, look through a uh, Western Hemisphere kind of gaze, the Americas, right? So it's native, uh, Caribbean, uh, Mexican, Central and South American uh, art discourses um, for those people who are looking for those answers to the simple question of, you know, who was working in Haiti in 1970s. And I have a book here that says, these were the people that worked in the 80s, in 1970s, um, artist-wise, you know, so. Um, and now, yeah, it's just like a year old, uh, only three exhibitions. Um, we're all in the same boat, right? So everything has slowed down now. Um, and now we're here, uh, you know, just seeing what, what's our next move for, for, this, for the project. Yeah, so it is a project as you described. So how do the exhibitions and the library um, aspect of it kind of intersect between those two? Why did you want to create this resource for the space outside of wanting people to know these different types of histories? And how do you share the library with the public? What does that interaction look like? Yeah, um, the way that works is, so I'm working in phases, right? Um, the first phase for last year was like, let me just focus on exhibition making. A conversation around the object. Um, I was trying to start this year uh, with a program called Tanda to like actually focus on conversation making um, and how does that look like for a space like this and obviously with the library I have like tons of knowledge that I could pull from but how would that work and I was going to start that kind of uh, the experimentation of that. Uh, for the Tanda program it's kind of like a book club slash uh, cohort um, program where we all get six people at a time or people, uh, we come every week and talk about an essay or text or topic. Um, and right now, I think my best approach with the library 
uh, would be to be a good librarian of what I do have at the library because uh, if you go to my website right now, you're not going to see it, like any books on there. There's no like library tab for you guys to uh, look at it more. Um, as of right now, I am making a, a, a database of all the books that I make it that I do have in there for, you know, I want to just uh, search um, if they're looking, if they're in their research page, I want something to uh, look for. But right now uh, within, you know, all our, uh, our situation, I think what the task is for me is to be a good librarian and say like this is the this is the this this book here is kind of referencing what you're doing um or back you know or the other way around we're like hey you're 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 making your art your artwork that you're making actually uh comes up in this book you know so um i think for now uh uh the main task is to be a good librarian but i am trying to figure out other ways to like uh, activate the the knowledge that's in in the books um for the program Oh, that's really great. I love being able to give that history to people if they're studying something specifically within that work for them to dive a bit deeper into their practice. I know for Compound Yellow, Eric, you also have a bookshop there and a self-reliance school. Can you talk a bit about the self-reliance school component and how that program is incorporated into the space and kind of how it runs as a compound? I know it's multi-purpose as well. Um, initially, Laura, um, one of the founders, and Regin and Gloria lived within the space, shared a studio, and that kind of elevate, elevated this concept of it being a compound. What do all of those different sharings of economies look like in practice? Yeah, so I'm, if, if I may, I'm just going to go ahead and read her answer to this, um, because it's really rich. Okay, so imagine me as Laura, if you can. Um, Initially, Regin and I did share studio space. We had collaborated for years, since 2010 or so, and we're very good friends and collaborators. Uh, Regin lived in Albany Park and unfortunately had little time to do, act, to actually work here. And I worked in, in Hyde Park and had little time to use the studio either. We had uh, shed, shared dreams for years, but time and space made it difficult to bring our dreams of collaboration into everyday practice together. Maybe someday. Still other collaborators like, this is gonna be awkward, like Eric Peterson and Alberto Aguilar have continued, to, have continued to play a critical role here. The compound came from inheriting four main spaces, a house, um, a studio, a small odd structure or shed, um, and uh, let's see, and uh, which is used for the bookshop and temp uh, with temporary services. Um, and then two small galleries. Um, the difference from when it was the suburban from, uh, from my Laura's perspective is that we each see space functioning in relationship to others. Even the side yard has a role to play, like an ensemble theater. There are no small parts. Uh, some spaces are quiet while others take central stage, um, but they are all functioning on some level together, influencing each other in dialogue. I see it as an ecosystem. Everything needs to be cared for in order for the whole to be healthy. Um, there is a constant challenge here. I um, mean, let me talk a little bit about the self-reliance school. So I, I think, um, this is Eric again. Um, I think that she, uh, again, part of this is, is, is not thinking that there's one type of art. Um, so like not thinking that books and publishing, um, and libraries are different than galleries and museums and art um, with a capital A. Um, no, and, and also like things like camp and school and gallery openings, I think she sees as very much in the same zone, um, which I think is amazing. I remember one summer camp that she, she made in Hyde Park in part res with response to herself as an artist with with young kids, um, but also with other um, neighbors who had kids who weren't really happy with sort of a sleepaway camp and weren't really happy with um, other ways of summer happening. Um, so she created a summer camp that was kind of this like ad hoc insane summer camp where she had this um, handmade cart that she would push around. I, I sort of see it as, do you guys know the book, um, the book with the monkeys and the cap caps for sale. You guys know that book? It's like a children's book. 
she had this cart that was sort of full of caps and all the caps were different. They weren't different colors, but they were like a blanket that you could make a fort with or some dowels or a little cook stove or a little thing that you could make your own sports with. Um, okay, so all that said, now I'm gonna read her um, description of the Self-Reliance School. Okay. Um, the Self-Reliance School arose out of the collaboration with Temporary Services, Mark Fisher and Brett Bloom. Initially, Laura Lode, Matt Nicholas, and Regid and Gloria and I were working very closely together on creating the mission of this particular space in this time. The first long-term six months uh, was richly programmed project that we um, knew we wanted to have here, um, which was... Um, which was the T, which was TS and the Self Reliance Library. This led to the bookshop and the usage of the studio um, for talks, presentations, and workshops related to the library. This was a very comprehensive usage of all the spaces um, in concert with each other. So all of those four spaces really being woven or knit together. Um, this project was inspired by the Self-Reliance School basically as a prompt for creative people to think about what it means to be self-reliant in this time, while always understanding the importance and reality of interconnectedness and interdependence. This prompt brought many significant projects and artists to us, like Mel Potter um, and the Lucy Flowers Self-Reliance Gar Garden, um, Public Space Camp and Dylan Kale Jones, and the Weaving Lab by Marianne Fairbanks and others. Um, so I, another thing I kind of love about the Self-Reliance School and like and her previous iterations of, of camps and other types of schools um, is, you know, I think people like preppers and like people who are buying like 25 guns and like building concrete bunkers in the in the woods get all of the credit for learning how to or for saying they're self-reliant in this, in the culture we live in today. Um, but there's always such a sort of uh, chauvinism and maleness and testosterone and cr a little bit of craziness and a little bit of um, violence in that. Um, and I really see Laura's idea of the self-reliance library as like, again, sort of going back to like Berlin in the mid nineties, like how do we recreate society in a way that's generous, that's loving, that's creative, um, where you're self-reliant uh, in that you can grow food, but also that you can like turn that food into an amazing artwork. Um, so I, I think it, it's like a really generous and, and kind type of prepping, if, if that makes sense. Um, and, and also like being prepared to make the type of everyday life that you want to make. Um, and so, so yeah, I, it's, it's like making a bunker, but with as a, like a cultural bunker, if that makes sense. Yeah, I love that. And I definitely, I saw Tracy's comment about how the conversation is really overlapping the relationship between art and libraries and sharing of resources and learning resources as well, which right. I think is important. A lot of things that artist spaces do is inviting people in to learn, to grow, and to have conversations through artistic practices. So kudos to you all for that work. I wanted to talk a bit about kind of the models that you all have regarding how you run your space. I believe half of the artist run spaces are nonprofits. I'm curious as to were they always nonprofits or was that shift necessary for you and how that evolved the practice of the work that you were able to do within that artist run space? So I think um, Compound Yellow, Roots and Culture and Heaven are all nonprofits. So if you guys want to speak about that, um, that would be really great. Should I go? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, like I said, my background was in nonprofit work. So that and especially at the age I was at when I started Roots and Culture, I, I was, you know, in that work. It's what I knew. It was my skill set. Um, and it also, to me, I mean, it, it, had the, it had the step of legitimacy and seriousness. Uh, I guess I always, I, I always intended for Roots and Culture to have 
a you know a, a shelf life to exist for a, a while and it seemed like you know to sort of uh establish establish the framework of a nonprofit and open up the opportunity to uh get funding was a way to uh you know become an institution i guess um so yeah i it's not easy and i wouldn't say that it's really um you know it it's it's not in profit there's there's not there's not really a whole lot of resources and it's been a pretty tough road in terms of uh you know, we, we received our 501c3 the same year of the Great Recession. And, um, it, you know, the, the nonprofit I worked for in the uh, early 2000s, the budget there was about 80%, uh, the revenue budget was about 80% grant revenue. And uh, for Roots and Culture, it's been more like 15, 20%. Um, so we've really had to adapt to different models um much more of a fundraising model um i would say that one of the greatest assets of running a nonprofit at least at our scale is uh our board of directors and uh who really functions at times like a a, a staff really they're um you know contributing their skills and and advice in kind and um you know, I couldn't really do the work I do without them. And, you know, I have really, so the, the our model for the board is we keep it small. There's seven members and um, I have pretty close personal relationships with most of the, all of them actually. Uh, some that date back 20 years. Um, more recently, we've brought on some alum of the program. Uh, Risa Puleo is a, a, one of our Connect residents. Ivan Lozano is uh, what, an artist in our double exposure program. So it's been super valuable to have their perspectives of having you know, been through our program to help steer and guide it. Um, so it, it's all very close knit and uh, familial in a way, and I feel incredibly supported by them. So on that, that's I'd say that's really the the biggest advantage in our sort of experience has been to have that really excellent group of of you know mentors and um, contributors. So, um, but yeah, I if if I get asked all the time if I would recommend going the nonprofit route, and, and it, it's it's kind of hard to say. Um, it's not glamorous, and uh, it's not like there's you know money pouring in. Um, but I think that it does provide sort of a a framework for sustainability in some sense. Yeah, I like that idea of building that framework for sustainability because grant writing and trying to do all the fundraising is one of the hardest aspects of running a nonprofit to be able to sustain itself. But I know Heaven Gallery, you guys have additional sources of revenue that you're able to bring in. So you all have a connection to the community through the small vintage shop. You work with the park district as well. Um, can you talk a bit about that model in addition to it being a nonprofit and how that helps make it more sustainable for you all as well? Yeah, so um, like I was saying, I came here in about 2009. And before I came to Heaven Gallery, I actually have a previous life as being a eBay power seller. <laughs> um, so I've been slinging vintage for a long time, but now I'm doing it for a good cause. Yes. Um, so uh, it was Acre, I believe, that had a rummage sale here. Um, and it was a one day rummage sale. It was all these like vintage clothes and they made one, they made a thousand dollars in one day. And so I was just like, hold up. <laughs> I was like, I can do this for us. And so we um, carved out this little area of retail so when people uh, walk in there's just I would say it's probably an eighth of the total space um, so when people pass by on the street level they see um, a sign that says art gallery vintage sale 
open today. And so they just go up the stairs and um, what we what we discovered was not only did we find um, this revenue stream, but um, we also found that we were uh, really broadening our audience to all of these people that would never come into an art gallery or gallery hours. So we went from like 15 to 20 people coming in every weekend for gallery hours to 500 people coming in. Um, so the clothes really um, work as a buffer to kind of people who find art spaces or um, sterile cubes as unapproachable or too serious. Um, it really buffers the experience for them so that um, when they walk in, oh, it's a store, and then they walk in a little further, and then we start having these much deeper conversations with them um, through the art. Um, I also recently have started doing these impromptu um, art like uh, tours of the exhibition. So when the space is full, I'm like, okay, who wants a tour? Who wants to learn more about this right now? So it's just, it's a really weird uh, model, but people like it because they feel like it's unique. And um, it, makes, it makes people a lot more open than they would be um, in like a gallery space, is I guess what I'm trying to say. So 50% uh, of our budget comes from the store, a little more than 50%. Oh, wow. so we'll just say 50. So the other 50 is, um, is grants, is uh, art sales, is uh, donations to our events. Um, and then there's one more thing. Oh, the benefit, of course, the benefit. So uh, having a, a diverse revenue stream is very important. Yeah, no, I love that. 50%, that is quite a bit. And I love that you're able to reach a different clientele who would just see it on the street and come in. Because I do think that there are oftentimes barriers um, between people not wanting to engage and interact with art. And I love that you use that as a buffer and kind of reel them in and then they come back and they bring other people. So I think that's a really great model. Eric, do you have anything to add about the nonprofit kind of component of Compound Yellow? Sure. I think, uh, I don't think Laura's ever had a nonprofit technically, like it's never been a for-profit, but it was never technically a nonprofit until last year. Um, <clears throat> I will, I will say like Alma, there's a ton of different revenue streams. Um, and I think that the biggest revenue stream for Compound Yellow and Shop and the previous iterations has been people just barter. It's, it's not really revenue of money coming in and money going out. Um, it's barter. It's um, young artists coming in uh, and having a show that they realize is a generous like act by the organization and then they come in and help the next person set up their show. So there's not sort of a, a a preparator line item um, and also and, and sort of like in terms of just sustainability that um, I think Laura recognizes that dip, that artists have time to help at different times in their lives so like there'll be a time when you know one artist is there just like for a whole year just gunning full full steam ahead and then they have to slide out and do grad school or they slide out and do you know, they have a kid or they slide out and do more um, at their um, day job or something like that. And then someone else slides in because there's this real um, great uh, sort of, uh, it, it's fun to do the work that's there. Um, I, I will say that, you know, some of the other ways that, uh, you know, shop, shop raised money because um, it was a giant mansion. The church didn't, want to sell it or knew, didn't really know what to do with it. Um, we spent a ton of time like fixing it up, you know, John Price and myself and Laura and Jeremiah Hulsebo Spofford and um, a ton of other people, Teresa Pankratz, um, so many other people helped sort of fix it up. So like we did a renovation that may have been worth or like a pseudo renovation that may have been worth $50,000 if you had to pay somebody. Um, you know, it cost a little bit, 
a couple buckets of, um, of putty or something like that. Um, and then some of it is just, uh, you know, Laura and her family are putting some of their um, day job money in um, to buy food and uh, sort of recognizing that she could spend all of her time or a lot of her time fundraising to buy a couple bottles of wine and some cheese, or she could just go buy it and not spend that and, and spend that time doing some of the other stuff that would cost more money. Um, and then again, we've similar again to Alma, we've had a couple um, shop had a, um, a thrift store that was just was the I guess the only thrift store in Hyde Park. Um, so there's just different ways of scrap scrappily making a few bucks. But but I think a lot of it um, is keeping costs really low as as much as possible. Um, and certainly in the current iteration, I think she recognized that the former suburban space that's now compound yellow has these sort of wonderful outbuildings and if she owned it as her family home she wouldn't have to pay rent she wouldn't have to do worry about some of that stuff about i think also about people saying no to things um so it, it really helped helps with that so i i know there's a ton of different ways to do it but i think that was one of the things is keeping those costs really low and working with people power yeah, power the people, most definitely. Yeah. I definitely want to dive into some of the challenges of running an artist-run space, aside from um, not just financial things and whatnot, um, marketing, but also like the labor that goes into it. Um, I know I've used to run a former art space called AMFM Gallery as well, and it was very intense, like the amount of work and labor that goes into running a space of your own. I wanted to pivot and talk a bit with Tracy. I know that a lot of your past and your history, you come from a ubiquitous background with large-scale cultural institutions and foundations. So how did working through that lens shift the work you were doing on a smaller scale with your artist-run space? And having that background, can you speak to the rest of the people about um, the influence of being able to have that type of backing um, for the last part? How does having that knowledge and that backing of how foundations and things like that work uh, to your advantage to being able to offer insight? Yeah, I guess. Well, one thing I would say is that, you know, um, you know, it's really interesting, you know, to I'm really interested what everybody, you know, who's in this, who's uh, joining us has to say, because I think there's a lot of knowledge in the group. But I would say that I started you know, I started as an artist and then worked my way up to um, like different, you know, places in, you know, administration. And so I wouldn't say that root work is informed by my, um, you know, by my work in administration. I mean, maybe, maybe I think this ability of co-curation and co-creation, which has really been kind of resident in the way that I work in general, like always, you know, asking questions and sourcing wisdom from the group and that kind of thing, but it wasn't necessarily, so um, Root Work is not a nonprofit. It is, um, you know, I come from a, um, a family that um, is also uh, a spiritual family, but a syncretic family in um, mixing a lot of traditional kind of like Judeo-Christian um, types of uh, values with like syncretic religions, like, you know, hoodoo and that kind of thing and the belief in, you know, in the spirit world. And so in that is this notion um, of service and of, I'm going to say tithing, because that sounds like, um, you know, something that people might know about, um, too. And I would say that uh, for me, root work um, has really been about, like, finance for my day job. And so I really have, you know, seen it. I'm not a church going person. Root work is about as close to church as I have gotten over the last several years. And um and I really, you know, saw myself um, putting uh, what I would maybe tithe or something like that of both my time and my resources into it. And um, and and as I think about the next iteration of it, you know, because I have worked um, bo both in nonprofits, my, I began my career um, as the dire director of a homeless shelter uh, when I was 23. Um, and I've worked in nonprofits and, you know, worked in libraries, worked in educational settings, um, worked as an arts administrator, et cetera, and um, have worked twice as a funder. And so I'm kind of leery of the 501c3 idea. I'm not taking anything away from anybody who must rely on it, because I do think art spaces actually need more um, support um, 
in the nonprofit environment. And I spent a lot of my career trying to make sure that they got just that and supporting them. So that's not what I'm saying. But for me, I think, um, because also, you know, I've never worked full time as, um, you know, as an artist, that's an incredible work, um, you know, and a lot of living in like liminal spaces. So I definitely take my hat off to um, full time artists and to people who run art spaces full time, especially artists run spaces. But for me, rule work, you know, has, it started as a very individual and very small concern that I really wanted to open up, um, you know, to others. So what, you know, so I guess what I'm trying, what am I trying to say here? There's a lot of different thoughts in my head. I guess what, I, um, what I'm thinking about is, is that running root work, though, has kept me honest. So I started root work when I was still deputy commissioner over at Department of Cultural Affairs and Special Events. And it was just time. I mean, it was just time. There was nothing that I could do. It's like if you have locks, you know, anybody who had locks here, you know, there's a day when you have locks and maybe they're down to here. And then the next day you shave and people say, what happened? And you can't describe it to them. But there's a moment when the locks say, I got to go. So there was a moment when Root Work said, it's now or never. And, um, and there, it, was, it was a lot of stuff that was happening. But it was like, it, it, you know, it's, it's now or never. And so Root Work said, look, I'm, I'm going to be. And boom, and it happened. I mean, it really did. I mean, of course, there's a lot of steps in between. And, um, and so, but that wasn't, it wasn't like, I'm like, oh, now I have this idea. It was an idea that I had um, held for about 20 years, a little, maybe 20 plus years at that time. Um, and, but I think, you know, working in, in foundations and stuff for me has meant that what I have learned from that, I guess that has impacted root work more than anything, is that the wisdom is in the group. So a lot of um, the ideas around um, exhibitions were really about me memory. It's really about things that I want to think about. Like, you know, I have loved Gloria Anzaldúa for a long, long time. And I was thinking about a particular passage because I am a librarian. I went to library school. So I think a lot about text. So I wanted to have um, an exhibition that really looked at this idea of the borderland and, and looked at this idea of shadow space and also looked at this idea of, 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 of you know, the way in which women navigate um, memory. And then before that, I, I wanted to have an exhibition called A Tender Power because I was thinking about Bessie Head and this idea of isolation and fuel. And so Kimberly Harmon is an artist that I have been thinking about her work. And, you know, there were like people like, uh, you know, um, Glow One that I wanted to have in the exhibition, you know, around Gloria Anzaldúa. So I guess what I'm, what I'm thinking about is that then in each of these exhibitions, people would come in, you know, and I never really advertise, you know, I always have just a, uh, just a little uh, uh, thing on Facebook and then later a thing on Instagram. And, you know, Root Work is notorious for like telling people about an exhibition in 72 hours. And I get that from my grandfather because my grandfather was a barber in Watts and um, he never had a sign. He built the barbershop on the back of our house. And um, every, every Friday and Saturday, it was a line around the corner. And if you didn't know that he, they were all waiting to get into a barbershop that, seat, that seated like maybe five people, but only one man cutting your hair, you were asking yourself, why are these people lined up on 99th Street? I always wanted root work to be about that. It needs to have such good juju that people are going to come and they're going to fill it up in 72 hours, not the art scene, not the people posing, but the people who want some of the juice that Root Work has to offer, because that's what Root Work is all about. Each is called according to the medicine. But um, what I learned, I think, being a funder too, is that the wisdom is in the group. If you're problem solving, go to the people for whom uh, the issue you know, d directly involves, not the people who are studying it and all of that. So what has happened for me in Root Work is that you know, we would set an exhibition and then people would come and say, aha, you know, have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? Glow One, for instance, was part of this crew called Synergy, which is black and mostly Latina. And, um, and she was like, you know, all of my Synergy sisters, you know, as I do my graffiti, that's who I'm thinking about because they put me on when I was like 14, however old she was. I'm listening to her talk about it. And I say, Glow, you know, can we get um, the folks from Synergy? And we worked on it, worked on it, worked on it, put in email. She did some calling. People were a little bit, you know, kind of like, let me see what this is. But by the time we got most of them together, I said, 
we are not going to be able to, to get them together all, all thinking about this at the same time. So within 72 hours, we did an artist talk and it was standing room only people looking outside because we had to seize that moment. And, and it was the first time in 15 years, some of them said that they had been in the same room talking about synergy. So I think what I, I so there's a symbiotic relationship between my arts administration part and, and funding um, experience um, with root work, but not a generative one. Root work exists on it, on its own because I think fundamentally maybe all of us are cultural workers. So that's in my, that's, that's who I am. But I do think um, how I think the suspectness that I have about the 501c3 world and its sustainability as 501c3s proliferate and then ultimately sometimes have to um, compete with each other in the space makes me not want to enter root work into that space if I, you know, if I can help that. And we make, we, root work may go on beyond me. So I'm talking about Tracy Hall here. And then I think the other space as um, a funder is to understand that the, the wisdom is in the group. And now back to, you know, administration over at the American Library Association, you know, a part of that is also too about the dissemination and the um, codification of folk practices. That's what I'm thinking about now. No, I think you put that really well. And that's a great segue into my next question. I'm just kind of throwing it out there. Like, what do you all think is the best model for sustainability? Do you think it's community supported through rentals and kind donations or philanthropic nonprofit route through grants and mandated support? What does sustainable even look like to you all? And also curious for John, I know um, you're a new space, like are you thinking about becoming a nonprofit? Is that something that you aspire to be? Or if any of the comments that we're talking about here has changed your mind or? Yeah, yeah, um, that's definitely a model I'm thinking of, but I think I'm on the same boat as Tracy of like when when you actually have the, the structure of a nonprofit, then what, what am I gonna be losing in terms of me and myself as a, as the main organizer, funder, and patron of the space. Um, I don't know what would that look like. Um, I work very slow, so for me, um, maybe the nonprofit structure will kind of make me have more timelines and more datelines uh, to, to kind of, um, you know, have. But I, I don't, for now, uh, for now, I think what my main focus is to actually figure out what the project is. Uh, as I said, like earlier, uh, for the first year, I was really just focusing on exhibition. This year, I'm focusing on library uh, programming uh, to the best of my abilities, you know. Um, so sustainability for me, um, as I went to Columbia to get the arts administration degree, it became very kind of uh, obvious that like if you don't have like an actual physical place to actually do the program, to do the, the work, if you don't have that funded, uh, five to ten years out or have like uh, that structure if you could have that place um, sustainability um, the the program that I the, the sustainable program that I want to do with you know you have to like uh, put those two in in, in practice I'm sorry um, but what I'm trying to sustain right now is the conversation more so than the actual space um, mm -hmm thinking about, uh, so the, for the first year though, it was in my apartment. Uh, for the second year, uh, thanks to the propeller fund grant, uh, I was able to uh, lock down a warehouse space and we were supposed to already <laughs> open up a new exhibition there, but uh, within this pandemic, that didn't happen. So now it's just like stay, staying there, not being used. Um, and, that, and I'm gonna just get that as a loss in my end, right? Because I, I was really trying to put really looking forward to actually like push more of a program now that it's out of my apartment. Um, I don't know if, uh, if any of the other uh, uh, panelists were like thinking, uh, had like a, a gallery in their apartment. It's, it's such mental work that I wasn't prepared for to just have artworks in your space, always prepping it. Um, so going back to, and this is going back to sustainability in terms of the financial of what the first year taught me was I have to first maintain my mental, emotional sustainability first before I'm able to think about uh, the financial, uh, actual physical place uh, sustainability, if I'm really thinking about having a longer, slower conversation. Um, so, I mean, I do have other plans. I do have like uh, blueprints of like, what would the financial sustainability look like? Um, none of them yet have I been able to execute? Um, hopefully, 
uh, at the end of the year, I'll be able to see if like those, the financial boring nonprofit stuff, accounting books and all of that would be, uh, would be executed. But for now, I'm focused on sustaining the conversation, sustaining uh, my emotional health, um, mental health, um, and also um, labeling it. Like when I do have to make a, a financial purchase, I label it that if I do have to make, have to buy a new lighting for the exhibition or buy more books, uh, books, books are expensive, you guys. One was like $80. Uh, it's, it's crazy. Um, and like the library portion is, you know, a main factor, like it is the main factor of the whole space. So like buying an $80 book when I'm, when I'm purchasing them, I'm thinking this, I'm thinking of it as a patron, right? As a funder uh, of the program, as opposed to if I was having the administration or organizer kind of hat on, I would be thinking, oh, why am I, I'm just an organizer, why do I have to buy this? But the, 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 the financial pill is easier to swallow uh, if I have the patron hat on, if I have the founder hat on, like saying like, I am buying this uh, as a patron and as a founder, uh, more so than an organizer administrator. Um, so yeah, that's my little bit of, of sustainability right now with the, the, the project that I have going on. Oh, that's great. I think you make a really great point talking about making sure that you're good and you're sustainable because I think a lot of times burnout is like one of the major reasons for places not being able to last like groups coming together and disbanding and things like that it's the power in the people so I definitely appreciate you touching base on that does anyone else I, have anything to add about the sustainability model yeah I I think um I would um I would also say that like not everything has to be sustained forever. Um, and it's okay to sustain, you know, maybe you want a, a pro, I, I, I like to think about it like running a track race. Like if you're Usain Bolt, you, you need to sustain that speed for nine seconds, right? So, you know, I think it's more about deciding, are we, uh, is your space gonna run at a sprint or is it gonna run a 400? Or is it going to run a mile, um, and then to to work in that way? I know I, I think uh, Chicagoans are just Chicago artists and cultural workers are super hardworking, and we always want to be at a sprint, um, and we get really excited about the ideas that we have and that our peers have. Um, and I'm definitely guilty of this. I know Laura's guilty of this, uh, and a lot of our team is. Is that you you hit the ground running and 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 run a mile at a sprint um and then maybe maybe the next maybe the next thing is to to take that time um and so i don't know i just think that sometimes like maybe sustainability is not about like having it last 50 years maybe it's about having a program that's insanely crazy fast and going at 125 percent for two years, and that's fine. Um, and and I and I think it's it's fine to be flexible, and it's fine to be fluid in how um, you know to scale up when you're when you've got a great opportunity. I know that's one thing that happened with um, the Southside Hub of Production or Shop, which was Laura saw that she had this space for at least a year, so she could have spent all that time developing a board and getting documents together for a nonprofit and doing all that stuff. And she tried that for about a month and realized that what she really wanted to be doing, she's like, I only have this space for sure for a year. So let's do some stuff. Um, and so she, she said like, I can't do soft shop and um, the Hyde Park Kunstverein and the thrift store and red flags bar um, all at once and do the stuff to make a, a nonprofit and to do that paperwork and board meetings and things like that. So that sort of sustainability was like, we have this for a year, let's run it a sprint. Um, and, and, and so maybe it's more about like doing this, uh, this is another stupid metaphor, but doing it like a um, accordion where you, sometimes you're like pushing in and sometimes you're pulling out uh, or, or whatever that's called. Does anyone play accordion? doing this and doing that. 
No, definitely not stupid metaphors. I was very poetic in the way that you're describing um, space and kind of how people come together. So I love that. And I think people need to hear that um, idea of things not necessarily needing to last for long periods of time. Sometimes it's just a slice of life at that moment in time and doing the hardest and best work that you can do. So for Eric and Alma, you two are the veterans of the group. Do you guys want to give your take on what sustainable looks like to you all? Um, um, Alma, you can, you can. Okay. <laughs> um, well, sustainability, I'm also thinking about, so we do an internship here and I'm really funny with our interns. I'm like, don't bring any outside food in here because I don't want garbage. <laughs> so we make communal meals. So, um, every day that we work, one person makes the meal and then, uh, we have a back deck that we have this big garden on that we get food from there. So um, really thinking about um, more of the model that Eric was talking about with this um, this garden, this bookstore, this kind of uh, solidarity economy, thinking about making everything that we need. Um, so I just think that, of course, a diverse um, income stream and then also using sustainability throughout the whole space like um, for food for composting so we have a, a composting area in the back so we compost all of our um, food scraps so just thinking about it in every aspect of our lives sustainability that's what i wanted to add no i love that as well i think eric do you have anything to add i'm i'm kind of pissed off these days a little bit <laughs> To be honest, I, I mean, I'm, I, I feel like the conditions for artists in America are, they're paltry and precarious. And I think that there needs to be a thousand times more funding for artists working organizations, you know, across the board. I, you know, I, I, I deeply admire and respect the sort of like scrappy condition of the Chicago artist run scene. Like it's inventive and resourceful because we're working with so little, but we actually have the advantage of cheaper rent and bigger spaces in Chicago, which is, you know, one of the conditions why this, this the activity thrives here, I think. But, um, Yes, I think that certain projects run their course, like um, the Hills Aesthetic Center was an amazing space, which burnt down and that ended their run. But, you know, there is this kind of like hard and fast model, it's sort of project model of a, run, a space. Uh, but I also, you know, as a space with, with some longevity, like, you know, I, I set forth to, to have, lasting power and i i wish that there could be you know like i i'm also really influenced and interested in the um the heyday of nonprofits in the the 80s and 90s in chicago uh randolph street and name and um you know there was a time when the nea was giving more money and there was the opportunity for these amazing project spaces that showed you know really progressive work and um i i just wish there was funding for more of that activity um it's sad um yeah yeah there's no. never enough funding <laughs> I'm so, I'm, i totally agree with you eric um but it's also kind of a it can be a double-edged sword too um we had a i also work at the smart museum um and we had a program with um a bunch of folks from great <laughs> from great britain who came who came out um who were essentially studying chicago for its artist run spaces um and some of you in the audience may may have been at that meeting and i want to share that with all of you too but basically what they were saying is they were they were kind of like so used to state funding they were really used to like this the you know england or or whatever the uk like just giving them money this um and i know that's the same in germany where the cities and towns have historically given money for art spaces 
but now they're starting to get now the spigot is 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 starting to get lessened and lessened and so they were asking us how we do what we do <laughs> um so there's sort of this you know it's it's a little bit of a it's tough to know like i really appreciate all of you all of you for how you've been able to scrap together and make this amazing cultural scene in chicago um although we would want more money of course it, you know once that spigot turns off now they don't really know what to do but they're like because they don't have any history of of what we do so it's sort of a it's a double-edged sword but um but i agree like more money for the arts and i know that uh, d case has been pushing more and more for neighborhood arts funding uh, which has been great yeah most definitely i do think that's important to note as well like chicago is really known for its culture and its cultural producers and the people putting in the work and not necessarily even for funding or for financial purposes people are just doing it for the love of the work and wanting to give back to their city and take in that stuff so that's a perfect segue for my next question and kind of talking about in the midst of major and minor artistic institutions how do you think artists run spaces fit into the cultural landscape of an overall artistic community like Chicago and what does collaboration look like between these spaces and anyone can answer that I guess I'll go. Um, so I haven't collaborated uh, with actual spaces. Uh, I can currently have collaborated with Cintinta uh, Previa program, which is run by Jose Luis Benavides. Um, and collaborating with the program is uh, definitely fun. Uh, I guess it would be funner to collaborate with the program rather than an actual space. Um, as programmers around the whole city of Chicago, um, they need spaces to do their programming in. So for me, uh, as someone who has the actual space or ha yeah, has an actual space, um, my collaboration is definitely dedicated to all the programmers and organizers and administrators who have been doing uh, more work than me, honestly, but uh, because they don't have the space, um, would, would not uh, fit into the artists from Chicago artists, into this conversation where we're talking only about the space, right? Um, so for me, collaboration with programmers uh, is important more so than actual other spaces um, for for you know for to keep the conversation going going and one example would be with Cincinta Previa who uh, is a video screening works um, and they've been doing uh, screenings in film front comfort station um, and other other venues um, and as a space and as our both of our programs kind of do have uh, intersections and commonalities where like this makes sense this program uh so that's why we collaborated with uh the propeller from the 2019 propeller fund uh for the cita previa chukimarca uh, fund uh, grant that we got um so yeah collaborating with programmers more so than spaces i i'll go I, i'm i'm loving this conversation i'm loving the chat too um this is you know it's enlivening. One thing I'll say about collaboration that I learned a lot about, you know, at RUWORK, um, you know, um, for, is to collaborate with two entities. One is to collaborate with artists really as a partner and then really in a way of call and response because, you know, what was important, you know, to me um, was to take these conversations and to try to show the work of people that were working out concerns that were as much about um, uh, were as much about a spiritual process as they were about an art product. And so a lot of those people, a lot of people that I was led to, and this is like the weird part, this is the woo-woo part, um, I prayed and, and I said, um, let me show artists that actually come into root work because they understand what we're trying to do. Let me be connected with people who are really trying to look at like the spiritual genesis of certain types of ideas, not spiritual in terms of church, but understanding that it's something, at least they felt was planted in them. And it led me to show a lot of artists, um, you know, that hadn't been shown before to quote unquote, give people their first exhibitions. But the, the part that was so interesting in the collaboration was um, that we would read together. So when I talk about, um, 
uh, you know, some of the, you know, textual influences, like a lot of times I would be sharing texts with people um, and then they might come back and say, well, have you read this? So we would definitely be reading together, but we would be asking each other questions. And one of the, anybody who's been shown at Root Work knows this. A typical question for me is what do you want people to feel when they come in and what do you want them to take home? What type of change do you want to create in yourself? What do you want to loose in yourself? What do you want to release? And what do you want for community? And they would be engaged in things like the cleaning of the gallery or the preparation of the gallery. Um, we would always build altar spaces. You know, they would be asked to one of um, an artist that I showed who was shown for the first time um, when he was um, 79 years old. Um, his daughter, when he was much younger, had been killed in an auto accident when she was 16. He had never, um, he had dealt with it iteratively, as he would say, but we actually created an altar and he brought, and he had never, he said that, and he cried in the gallery, he had the moment by himself before we opened up and he wept and he said he had never felt that he had really dealt head on with her death and the magnitude of the void that that left in him before that. So that type of collaboration is critical. I mean, that's why root work is root work. The other part though, is collaboration with the community. And so, you know, I was based in Pilsen and Pilsen is very much like home to me because I grew up in, you know, Watts, which is, you know, mostly Latinx and African-American. It used to be much more African-American and some Latinx and now it's kind of flipped. But all people who are working class are, are, are working in the gray sector. Um, but the thing that was interesting for me is that where I was, I had a large homeless population who was encamped. Um, and I also had a, um, a Latinx community that had been there generations, generations, and both enact, they, they, they interacted and they acted up on root work. So one way is that I remember I was showing a lot of, um, uh, a lot of artwork that was like, you know, uh, very, a lot of abstraction. And um, Bobo, one of the, um, you know, one of my neighbors, you know, who's unhoused, you know, he came over and said, we've been looking in, this is, you know, this is not like the other uh, stuff you've been having. So we found this and it was like a, a really, you know, a, a beautiful painted picture of Jesus and the disciples at the last thing. It was like, this looks so much better than anything you have up in there. So we just wanted you to have this and, you know, you can put it in there. And I was like, okay. Bobo, thank you very much, you know, for this, because he, you know, he was like, this, you know, this is, and, and then I also had a neighbor that came to every single thing we did, and would kind of, if, you know, he would be in here, if this was in a physical space, and then he would read the newspaper and say, you need to have this person in the gallery, you need to ask this person to come in, and some of those people might be in London or Berlin, he would like be reading widely, and um, he would send me links, and so what I like to think, I always used to say, because he was a very quiet man, and he would never want like the spotlight, I even asked him once if I could introduce him. And I said to him, I would always say whenever he was here, I would just like to give a nod to my co-curator. So I'm gonna stop there. But I think in terms of collaboration, I really felt that I was in um, real deep collaboration with both my neighbors, um, as well as uh, both, both kinds of neighbors, as well as artists for root work. And they made all the difference in his first iteration. Well, I love that. Um, idea of collaborating with the artists, like bringing them into the space and asking them what they want people to feel when they leave that space. So that's a very poignant response, I think, Tracy. So thank you for that. Does anyone else have anything to add? I do want to talk a bit, since we're on the subject of collaboration and working with artists, um, and there's been some comments in the chat as well about professional development. I did want to talk to uh, Eric specifically, your space is known for its development opportunities for artists and curators with two visual art programs, Double Exposure and Connect as well. And they work with primarily Chicago-based artists and also curatorial projects from women of color curators, and that can be from anywhere, offering a three-month residency and an exhibition to mount and spearhead their projects. So how has this impacted the work you present and the artists that you've worked with and why were these programs something that you wanted to implement? Yeah, for sure. Um, as I said earlier, you know, like this, a major uh, impetus behind starting the space was to, you know, help artists develop their careers and provide a stepping stone and be an incubator. Um, and that's always driven our mission. Um, it's in our mission. Um, the, I mean, 
just to quickly talk about the sort of genesis of the programs, Double Exposure is 12 years old, so that program's been with us for a long time. Um, I, I was looking at like the advantages of group shows versus solo shows, and um, I felt like group shows, artists, they get kind of lost and usually the sort of the, the, the curator's conceit and, um, but I also saw that the dialogue was valuable in, in those situations where works are, are hung in proximity. Um, but I also like the idea of giving artists, you know, this space and freedom to mount ambitious projects. And uh, so that more of a solo show model, we saw the advantages of both and kind of landed in between with the two person show model where um, artists would, you know, have a dialogue, but also significant space to mount their projects. Um, and we've, we're very committed to paying artists. Um, that we, you know, that was something we always considered, but uh, weren't able to do until about maybe six years ago. And we're, cons you know, we'd like to consistently raise that, that stipend amount. Um, you know, as I was sort of ranting about earlier, I, you know, we really see uh, a, a lack of value in, in artists and um, and their labor. I mean, we're, I, I like to see how, you know, I'm making a hundred bucks on this panel today. You know, like, it's good that we're all, you know, we're all taking note and acknowledging the labor, even though, you know, we're, we're still underpaid. Um, so there's that side. Um, and then in terms of Connect, I think we're really, you know, focusing even further on uh, what, what sort of development, developmental steps we can offer to a curator uh, in that case. Um, so we've actually Connect in some ways predates double exposure uh, before we had a really established uh, sort of programming schedule. Uh, I was doing a lot of the curating in the first year or so, but I liked the idea of bringing in outside voices. So we started to accept uh, proposals from curators um, really from the beginning. So we, even in our first season in 2007, we ran an iteration of that. Uh, and then I lived in the space and there's a apartment in the mezzanine. Uh, I moved out in 2014 and that opened up the opportunity to host a residency, which was something that I'd always aspired to. Um, so we started Connect as a residency in 2016, um, and uh, it was a pretty successful program. Our first uh, curator was amazing, Risa Puleo, who's since joined our board. Um, and then the second year, we also hosted a woman of color, and uh, the programming committee with Risa now on the team, uh, we sat down and we, you know, made a commitment to equity in the arts and decided that we should narrow the, the eligibility. Um, so, I mean, uh, you know, we're committed to offering an opportunity for both artists and curators early in their career to, you know, to get that resume bullet, uh, to add a credential to to their their um, their professional, you know, um, avenues. So uh, yeah, I it all sounds a little nuts and bolts and grant languagey, but we're very much about the economics of this and um, about you know serving our community what they need. We offer. We pay for our um, for professional documentation, um, so we're you know offering as many services as we can. There's always more we want to do, um, but that's what we're here for. No, I think that's great, especially opening the doors to curators to be able to experiment and 
pitch shows and whatnot. I know in my early days of AMFM, um, I had a residency at the Chicago Art Department when I first moved to Chicago, and it was a really great space to be able to, I was one of their first kind of curatorial types of resident artists. So I was just essentially using it as a blank slate to be able to take the ideas out of my mind, be able to just put stuff up on the walls, come up with the concept. Because of, one of the major reasons for me wanting to open a space was it was hard to um, pitch all these things to these bigger galleries and spaces. I kept getting a lot of closed, closed doors, like non-responses and whatnot. So I love that you accept people to, you know, pitch ideas and have that curatorial model. And yeah. I was popping up around the city and collaborating and doing different shows with a lot of different artists run spaces. So sure. yeah. kudos mm -hmm. to you guys for having that open submission process as well. And I know that you at Heaven, um, Alma, also have like an open thing where you take in applications once a year as well. And you also have avenues for development, like internships, and you don't charge fees for proposals or exhibitions. So I'm curious why it was important for you to operate in this way and how does it influence the type of people that frequent uh, your space and are able to do shows and showcase their work? Um, well, it's important for us to be accessible, I think. I think that's really important um, when we think about um, cultural work is to be accessible. Um, so the interns is really part of our education. So we really do think education is really important as well as the kids uh, art classes that we teach at the parks district. Um, but really uh, what I wanted to do with the, all of the overall programming is really expand what Heaven does beyond the exhibitions um, to kind of create a micro art center. So think about like what Heaven Gallery is doing with this little bit of space that it has, thinking about that as a model or a case study for this much larger idea that we're trying to do with the whole building. Um, so some of the programs that we started extend to self-care. So um, an artist named Todd Matei has been doing these um, healing meditations, so sound healing, and where everyone who comes in is offered a blindfold and they could either lie down on a yoga mat or sit in a chair. Um, it's really an exercise to kind of free the imagination. Um, and then also doing these house music dance uh, parties that are like earlier in the day because you know how every time you want to go out and listen to house music, it's always like 10 or 11 o'clock at night and you have to stay out all night. So I was like, what if we did this at seven o'clock and it wasn't centered around drinking? It could just be like, oh, we have a mocktail or, you know, so it could just be about dancing, about really, um, really introducing people who don't know about house music um, to kind of the joy of it. Um, really thinking about building community on the dance floor, because I think that that's a really important um, way to connect with people as well as also take care of yourself and work out. I always say that if I could just be dancing all night, I could seriously be in shape. So uh, we, we launched these two projects or these two series um, the end of last year and both of them got really great responses. But thinking about having gallery as like this lab where we can try out all of these different things and do this experimentation and say, hey, look, this is how many people came to this event. This is how many people came to this. This is who we're reaching. We're reaching these kids. We're reaching these, you know, millennials and we're reaching, you know, uh, 30 some year olds. So it's just um, about being able to really have all community members be part of, of having gallery. Did I answer your question? <laughs> well, I think so. I think having that kind of collaborative mind and like having the accessibility of different types of programming that is going to draw and bring in different kinds of people as well. 
on. That's really great. I did want to talk to John as well. You have a, a project-based uh, space and your mission specifically supports multiple identities of the diaspora and art and conversation often tokenized in larger cultural institutions and seen through the white gaze. So I'm curious how your space is radically shifting and engaging communities through the artists that you choose to work with and the types of projects that you host and how that is accessible to the community that you serve. Yeah. Um... That's the same question I had when I was first doing uh, research for this project. Uh, what it, it, it's been like a long journey of keep asking that question to a lot of people. Um, so I'm a preface saying that there is an answer. It's just that it's going to take more than five minutes to answer it. Um, going to take uh, a lot of back and forth with, uh, with conversation to actually really answer it, but I'll try to, um, approach it from just one bullet point. Um, and maybe if there's like questions after that, we could go after it. Um, Cause it, that's, that's a loaded <laughs> uh, uh, answer that I could give right now. And usually I go on rants. Uh, anybody who knows me knows I just go on rants for five hours talking about how, uh, answering that question specifically, but I'll try my best uh, to the best of my knowledge to give a, a quick short answer. Um, and I'll probably, you know, focus on one thing about the, the question is um, identities. Um, Chuki Marca is less about identities and more about location and locality. Um, there's a reason why it, I, don't, uh, I don't say Native Caribbean Latinx, because uh, Latinx is not a location. Um, when you shift the when you shift the conversation, let's talk about the location from where we're from rather than the identities, uh, you would see that it's more complex um, and you will see the differences and similarities between location by location. Um, an example of that would probably be like if I was an artist who grew up in uh, Logan Square, Chicago in the 90s uh, versus if I was an artist um, uh, who was raised in Pilsen in the 90s, right? It takes a certain kind of work and labor to identify those similarities and differences between those art practices. Um, and with that, with the library portion of it, hopefully, again, if I'm a good librarian, um, we're able to like pick up on those differences and similarities and have the space to have that conversation of what, what, it, uh, what does it mean if your artwork is wanting to have a social and cultural read versus uh, just having a more formalistic read, right? Um, so that, if, if that, if, did that kind of uh, uh, clarify a little bit of, uh, of the mission of Chukimarca? Um, because within uh, the Latinx identity, it being so complex um, and so different uh, from person to person, artist to artist, um, approaching this space, if we're trying to have a, a conversation around your work on a social and cultural level, um, it doesn't make sense if we're coming at it with, uh, with the moniker of Latino art. Um, so that's why the space is, is, is more about location and locality rather than uh, identities. Um, um, I yeah, I don't know, know. I could go on and on, but I don't know where um, this is. I wish we had more time to dive deeper yeah. into that. I'm, I'm open if anybody wants to email me and like video chat later about uh, my research thus far of, of, of it. Um, I'm super open for that. Yeah, most definitely. And I think this idea and conversation around location is a great segue uh, to Alma. I know that you've been fighting a hard battle with developers and Worker Park and trying to acquire ownership of your building to expand and create a prominent art center for Worker Park specifically. Can you speak a bit about this and why the preservation of arts is important and any challenges that you faced in trying to um, succeed in that? Well, I think it's really about uh, having more control over the narrative. Um, so thinking about uh, when I first came to Wicker Park in like the early 2000s, um, I think about places like the Silver Room was one of my favorite places. I think about the Double Door. Um, so those places in good music was everywhere. I mean, there was, uh, you know, um, it was a lot more diverse. It was a lot more magical then. And, you know, as it's become gentrified, everything that made it meaningful has been kind of stripped away. And so um, 
recently when the, the double door got pushed out, I really felt a calling to do something big. And I thought to myself, you know, that I wasn't going to leave. You know, we always hear these stories of like, oh, you know, the, the building's for sale. You, you have to move to another neighborhood. You have to go to a uh, more affordable neighborhood where you then will gentrify working class out of there. So just really wanting to stop this inequitable cycle and saying, no, this is where we labored. This is where we did the work. This is where we've been and this is where we plan to be. So I really find this moment right now where um, these kind of this, this norm of exploitation to the arts is coming to head where it's like, they actually need us now because on Milwaukee Avenue, there's so many businesses that are going vacant because of the overpriced rents. And now with COVID, there's so many businesses that have just like all out permanently closed. So now I really feel that this project that I've been working on for the last two years is, is in a position to where they really need us because as we know, the arts are an economic driver. And really thinking about the way that we think about how, um, well, of course you're gonna leave because that's the way it is. And how inequitable is that, that here we are um, dedicating ourselves to programming and to community and accessibility and culture. And you know we have to leave our own neighborhood um, so I decided that I was going to organize all of my neighbors. I was going to go around and I was going to find everyone and make this group. And we did it. We did it. We found the group. We made it. We had our first board meeting. Um, and we're really hopeful for the future because we really think that, um, an art center with equity in the center of that, like grounded in equity is so important because we know that we can use the arts for social justice work. We know that we could use the arts for healing work like Tracy's talking about. So kind of creating the center for um, arts and wellness and culture. So thinking about, it's called um, Community Arts Wicker Park. Thinking about co-op is like this cultural umbrella that holds all of these other Alana arts organizations. Um, and then also creating a community land trust so that we can make sure that this building is affordable for the next hundred years. I like to tell um, Tempest Hazel that I'm gonna get the key and I'm gonna swallow it. <laughs> so really thinking about, thinking about how we can really um, use our power now for the future. Um, I made a promise to myself a long time ago that I wasn't gonna, that I was gonna leave this earth better than the way I found it. And I feel like this is something that I can do that can help future organizations that are, that are having the same problems that we're having to create this model of what we're calling, um, it's the Chicago model. So it's a multi-layered financial structure that buys properties puts them in these community land trusts, and then they are then um, governed by the community. So really just thinking big about um, the future of the arts and you know, what's possible when you have, um, when you share resources, when you um, really have this uh, very concise idea about what you want the center to be for. Um, so thinking also about small business, I definitely want to collaborate and somehow bring Eric Williams back from the Silver Room because um, he was down the street for, with a pop-up and that was like my dream come true. So uh, slowly but surely, it's going to happen. Oh, thank you for this work and certainly hope that you're able to bring it to fruition as you imagine because I do think that being able to hold that power and be able to bring people together that are doing multiple different practices and whatnot is important. I 
walking in Wicker Park is really disheartening now. Um, all of the cultural spaces that are gone, the restaurants and shops and stuff. Um, I used to love going down there, but yeah, it looks like a completely different place. And I think that, like you mentioned, Double Door and that whole battle between that was kind of the major impetus uh, behind the changing face of that area as well too. So uh, thank you for your work in that. I also wanted to talk about this idea of physical space when it's uh, no longer there and what that looks like in the legacy of artist-run spaces. I know for Tracy, root work has since closed. Um, I wanted to have you speak on the legacy of that space and what is next for root work, but also for everyone on the panel as well, thinking about how many artist-run spaces have sort of an ever-changing lifeline. They come and go in waves, hence why sustainability is at the core of this conversation, but their ideas come from people and they're born in communities that create long-lasting relationships and projects. So how important is physical space and how can we reimagine the future of space? Well, I'll say this and get out of the way because I want to hear what other people, you know, have to say about this, but um, I really, uh, I really, you know, took what Eric was saying about um, may maybe the idea of temporality and that maybe spaces run their course. I had read when I was opening up um, Root Work um, that most galleries have a lifespan of less than three years. And so I said, success for me is going to be, op you know, keeping the space open for three years plus. That was going to be success. But because I was running it out of my, you know, own pocket, Pilsen was getting to be, you know, it just wasn't tenable. And um, the other thing that I was looking at is, um, you know, that people of color were, um, you know, were, you know, being pushed out of Pilsen um, in terms of it being affordable. So I had to ask myself this question, you know, and I'm learning from you, Alma. I'm listening to what you're saying about swallowing that key. Um, but I had to ask myself, uh, you know, this question, can I think about um, root work in a way that it can be, you know, more generative because I was renting and it could be more generative and I can be in, um, in a situation um, where it can also, uh, you know, help to incubate other people's work um, and other types of things over time. Because in addition to the gallery, which I've talked a lot about exhibition, you know, it had become, you know, in a lot of ways, I'll say a formidable space for healing. I mean, and it's known and recognized, you know, for that. Um, and a space where a lot of great teachers and seers, you know, have had an opportunity to hold forth. And I value that. So the thing I was thinking about is, you know, how can, um, how can we move into our next three years? How can we allow some of the healing practices and pedagogies, um, you know, how can we give them space, um, you know, how can we provide, you know, um, you know, larger, you know, gallery space and maybe a couple, you know, types, I don't know, and, and just, you know, how can I align to the, to the next vision. So the thing that I, I said I would do is to just quiet, quietly, um, you know, have a dismount and to think about um, in the way that root work found its space to, to find a, a, to be led to another space. In that interim, what I've learned about um, root work, and I'm going to stop after this, is that um, people keep it alive for me. So like, I'm, I feel like I, I have a lot on my plate. I've handled some deaths and some changes in my family. I've, you know, handled, you know, a new job. I've handled a personal move. I've handled some, cha uh, handled some changes in my own life, um, in my own navigating, you know, like my own health and spiritual health and emotional health. And, um, and yet what's been interesting is that every week I get two, three people um, from either in Chicago, but other places asking me about root work. You know, when is it gonna open again? Or I remember this happening at root work, um, et cetera. And so what I'm learning is that root work is reconstituting itself because it lives in the collective memory of those who experienced it directly and indirectly, those who came to it and those who heard about it. And I'll tell you this, in the influence that it's had on Chicago in a short time, I mean, in which we are able to talk about the symbiotic relationship of art and healing, the connectivity, um, in the way that we're able to talk about hoodoo and conjure and all of those kinds of things that are inherent in root work and um, in the folk practices of um, indigenous and uh, people of color in a way that is up top. And when I first came, when I was first talking about it, you know, and I was still at DK's, a lot of people were like, you are so brave to talk about that, you know, and do you feel like it's going to delegitimize um, your practice as an arts administrator or your role or validity as an arts administrator? And now I hear very few, especially people of color, talking about the twain as if they never do meet. So, you know, I really feel like I've been utilized, um, you know, 
um, maybe in a way that I didn't um, expect uh, you know, to, to do that. So I feel like root work is much bigger than me. And so maybe it's reconstitution will have to look like that. And so this conversation is really helping me. I'm learning, I'm learning a lot from each of you. And I thank you for that. Um, I've got a, that's, that's awesome. I, um, I do think in some ways what you're saying is the space is connected to the space really is the people, the space is important, but it's also people's memories of the space but and that travels forward and it also travels backwards through history um, which is really really cool um, I'm going to say something that Laura and Laura wrote which is awesome um, and she has been in a number of spaces with this I, I want to call it one project but it's different names one project um, is that there's a specific sort of or a particular psychogeography um, that connects with memories for people in certain spaces. So like you could think of it as your childhood home, right? Like you, the, whether, you know, it's just a house, but it has these, or an apartment or wherever you lived, it has these memories. Um, and it has this certain something that's different than other people's places where they grew up. Um, and then she's, she also writes about um, what I'm going to call the three chis. Um, and she says that each physical space presents a particular character, charm, and challenges. Um, and I really like that. And I, when I read that, I was like, that also is all the people that have worked at, in these spaces in Compound Yellow. It's like they, they each bring their certain character, their certain charm, and then definitely everyone has their certain challenges to work with, right? Um, certainly me as well. Um, and my last sort of thing I want to talk about um, is two, two sort of things. Um, thinking about the Pantheon in Rome as this, um, I don't know, <laughs> you're laughing, um, as this kind of model, right? So it started off as this um, space in, uh, for Romans to practice religion, right? Um, but to survive, it became a Christian space and it c uh, continues to stay as a, as a church but really it's this sort of about the people inside um, that make the space. Um, and um, the other thing I wanted to, to mention is um, Laura always thinks about um, Niles Norman, who um, wrote extensively about things called adventure playgrounds. Um, and adventure playgrounds were these sort of, they're these sort of like almost anarchic, sort of play spaces where kids um, own their own play. They get hammers, they get nails, they have two by fours, they have rocks, they have pieces of concrete to just make their own world. Um, and they sort of started in the ruins or the rubble of, um, of bombings in um, World War II in London, or, or they sort of became this thing that was known where, mostly mothers would bring their children and then the children would turn these bombed out buildings into places of joy and action and social learning, right? Um, and I think Laura definitely thinks about um, creating cultural spaces as sort of building these adventure playgrounds. Um, wherever the space actually is, I think she sort of has this idea and I think of us share this um, sort of disheartening idea of um, like post-industrial capitalism, third wave, cap whatever ca type of capitalism we're living through now as this sort of ruin of human and cultural possibility. Um, and what she is trying to do in her project, this overarching project, I think, is to create an adventure playground out of that, to let all of us be those children that are taking our ingenuity and taking physical things, taking objects and then presenting it and working with it with each other and playing together to create the world that we want to live in and to actually do it and not just like talk about it or think about it, but to actually do it. Um, and I think hearing from all of you today and knowing what you do as well, um, I think that that's what all of us are doing is creating these spaces whether it's in the same physical space as it was in last year or next year um, to create your own society that 
then other people can participate in and then they create their own society. And then we all hopefully make this better place, this better space. Uh, thank you for that, Eric. Beautifully put, most definitely. And to Laura for sending her words as well. Um, we have a couple minutes left, we like about two minutes, but I don't want to be remiss in not mentioning the pandemic and COVID and everything that is currently happening. And that's why we're doing this conversation virtually, uh, otherwise we would be in person. So I'm curious as to how the pandemic has had effect on your space or perhaps impacted the future of your work or sustainability or how you all are just coping with that. Um, I know that exhibitions are postponed or canceled in that regard. Regard, but I know that it does have a large impact on the work that people are able to do moving forward. So I'm just curious as to if you have any um, comments to share about how that's affecting you all. I'll go really quickly. Um, uh, we've had to cancel basically everything that, you know, because the space is about bringing people together, but um, I uh, wanted to shout out Laura and Jorge Lucero have been de developing a book that they were doing before COVID uh, that is called the Compound Yellow Manual of Prompts, Provocations, Permissions, and Parameters. Um, and it life and so like and cultural production um, and this it was started before the pandemic, but it's being finished now during the pandemic. Um, and so in some ways, I think that Compound Yellow will be using publications, um, physical publications uh, and less, less digital stuff, but more just physical publications, um, sort of in the model of um, what Jorge's work has been, but also um, you know, public collectors and temporary services and Mark Fisher's work as well. And, and the sort of library idea. So I think it's gonna be more of a physical paper zines and, and books, um, but also this will be a PDF. So, um, but it's sort of different prompts of, of ways to make your society. No, thank you for sharing that. Looking forward to seeing this uh, lots of life and excited to, to hear more from other folks, how they've been impacted as well. I guess I could go. <laughs> um, so the way I approached it was like everybody just hold off on exhibition making. Uh, but as a small project, you know, I have some, I have no one to report to. So it's very, um, like my, the, the project could go any which way and it's very malleable. Uh, but the only, uh, the only thing I did want to make sure if, you know, during the pandemic was to actually honor all the projects that I had up and coming and say, we're going to do this. Uh, we're not going to cancel it. Uh, we just have to weather the storm out. And I think just approaching it in that um, um, is all we could really do. Um, on that back end of stuff, I've just been cataloging the library and, and focusing on accounting stuff. Um, so um, for me, as long as I'm approaching on that 101 basis uh, with the artists, uh, maybe how Tracy works as well with um, checking on them spiritually, checking on them mentally, like, hey, how are you doing? Um, is how I'm really approaching it because I think we're all uh, maybe having, a, a, you know, an anxiety of, of what's to come, so. Thank you. And so we're, like John was saying, we're, our main sort of focus is the commitment to the artists that we have programmed for the next, actually, you know, we, we have the schedule pretty much filled until what was supposed to be a year from now so we're kind of taking as taking it the news as it comes and backing everything up by a season for now um you know it's it's uh it's really feeling like a time to sort of like take care of ourselves and um i know in my life i'm you know i've got to run because i've got a hungry four-year-old banging on the door and uh you know my wife works full-time and uh, there's not a whole lot we can do as an exhibition space. So I've become a, you know, full-time caretaker to my child, which kind of reduces my capacity. We have another staff member. We have some plans to open up the archive on social media and, you know, sort of 
energize and reconnect our alumni and um, that's that's the the short term plan we're pretty sure that we're going to be able to survive through the next you know the commitments of that year of programming so that's really the focus there but obviously I don't know I don't want to bore everyone with all the setbacks but it's tough yeah thank you for sharing that yep. definitely appreciate you all for being in conversation with us today and doing it virtually I know that it's a learning curve but we're able to access a lot more people, I think, in this way as well, too. I will be making this uh, conversation available online as well. I've been recording this, so if anyone missed any components or wants to share it with other people, it will be available for that as well. And I just really want to thank Alma, Eric, John, Tracy, and the other Eric from Roots and Culture. Uh, thank you all so much, not only for being a part of this panel, but just for the incredible work that you all are doing within your artistic spaces and around the city of Chicago. This has, as I've seen in the chat, been a very inspiring conversation for a lot of people and myself as a cultural producer. And I'm very much looking forward to working with you all in the future and seeing the great programming and exhibitions and future that is to come uh, with your spaces. So thank you everyone for, for listening and for joining in. And I hope to see you all soon in real time very soon. So thank you very much. Thanks, Sierra. Thank yeah, you, Sierra. Great. This was amazing. Thank you, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, everyone. everyone. Be well. <laughs> see you in physical space soon. Yes, Maybe. I hope so. If not, I'll see you on the dance floor in the virtual world. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thank you all. Cheers. Bye. Bye. See you.